I'm Amber Tresca, and this is About IBD. It's my mission to educate people living with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis about their disease and to bring awareness to the patient journey. Welcome to episode 109. This podcast is part of the American Gastroenterological Association Colitis Conversations Program. For an unpredictable condition like IBD, setting goals is an important part of managing the disease. Getting symptoms under control is significant because it allows people to get back to their lives. But after the crisis of a flare-up is over, it's time to look at other goals. Treating to target is a concept that helps in setting these goals. However, it might not be something that is familiar to some patients. That's why I asked Dr. Neil Nandi, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine and IBD Specialist at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine, and Jacqueline Green, ulcerative colitis patient, writer, and IBD mom to dig deeper into this idea with me. Dr. Nani defines treat to target for us, and Jacqueline talks about how she and her doctors have been using this concept to help her achieve her goals. You'll want to stay for the end when Jacqueline tells us what happened the first time she brought a stool sample to the lab, and Dr. Nani gives an IBD research history lesson on the unfortunate mice who received tobacco smoke enemas. Our topic today on this colitis conversation is treating to target something that probably a lot of people have not heard of and so we want to dig into this deeper and explain what it is and i have two guests with me i have first of all i have jacqueline green such a pleasure to have you finally on the line jacqueline since we've been corresponding and talking via social media for a long time actually yeah it's been years thank you for having me amber and then we have an about ibd favorite Dr. Neil Nandi is with us again today. Thanks so much, Dr. Nandi, for coming back on About IBD. Absolutely, Amber. Thanks for asking me to come on. I'm excited. Me too. So treat to target. This is something that people with IBD and their IBD teams need to think about in terms of treatment. But first of all, I want to understand what that means. So I wonder, Dr. Nandi, if you could tell us what is treat to target in terms of IBD? Sure. So treat to target means that doctors have certain goals of care when it comes to helping a patient with inflammatory bowel disease feel better and get better. And it's important that patients know what those goals are. So doctors say treat to target because they're checking certain markers of healing, different markers, and then they adjust the treatment to get to those targets. That's a really concise explanation. I love it. And how do you work with your patients on a treat to target goal? So, you know, I, I begin by explaining, you know, what's the point of treatment, right? We have short term goals and we've got long term goals. And, and Jacqueline, no doubt, I'm sure you can relate to this too, right? You know, as a, as a patient, we, we don't want symptoms, right, to hold us back from life, right? So we don't want flares. Absolutely. And uh, so it's the short term goals of making sure we're in clinical remission. But then there's some long-term goals that are really important, and that is that we have gut healing, that the lining of our intestine is totally healed. The lining of our intestine is called mucosa, so we call it mucosal healing. And how might I know that you're the, inte- the inside lining of your colon is healed? Well, I have to look with a colonoscope. Uh, Jacqueline, do you like colonoscopes? Oh, dude. <laughs> I enjoy them, sure. Yeah, Who doesn't? Yeah. The, the sarcasm is just dripping, yes. And nobody, nobody loves colonoscopes, right? Nobody loves the prep and all. So we have to look at other ways uh, to evaluate healing uh, other than just mucosal healing, which is currently in 2022, the gold standard. And that's looking at laboratory markers, making sure that anemia has resolved, inflammatory markers, or markers like ESR, sedimentation rate, or CRP, C-reactive protein, have um, become normalized. We also look at stool markers of inflammation, and this is fun. Uh, This is good for all our patients to know if you don't, which is that there's a stool test that looks for inflammation in the colon. It's more sensitive for colon and small intestine, and that's called stool calprotectin. And if the number's elevated, it suggests active disease. And if you check one before a colonoscopy where there's disease, you can correlate the two. And instead of scoping people too frequently, you can check this every three to four months as you adjust treatment while you treat to target, you treat to heal. You want the calprotect to normalize, the ESR, CRP to normalize, the anemia to get better. And then six to nine months after starting a definitive treatment and optimizing it, 
you check a colonoscopy to look for mucosal healing. And that, in a nutshell, is what we refer to as treat to target. Perfect. Thank you so much for that explanation. I think sometimes a treat to target approach also means that patients need to be empowered and need to advocate for themselves. Jacqueline, have you ever done this treating to target and have you had to advocate for yourself to make sure that your treatment is getting you to your either your treatment goals as far as healing and symptoms are concerned or even like your life goals? How have you done that with your team? I have. Um, We didn't call it Treat to Target. I didn't know that that was a thing until you asked me to come on the podcast. So I was actually (laughs) getting into the research and I love that explanation, Dr. Honey. That was great. Um, So not specifically by name, but I am currently in remission and my doctors both, I have a primary care doctor and a GI right now, and they both monitor everything that you just went over. And I have a colonoscopy this year, so I get to go through the joy of all of that um, monitoring mucosal healing and making sure that everything is still on target. Um, I've been in remission since I was pregnant with my daughter, so it basically it's been monitoring for the last three years. Um, so my treatment goals have definitely changed over time uh, as my life has evolved. When I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, I was 24, and I had just started my first big girl job. <laughs> Uh, and I <laughs> was moving in with my boyfriend and, you know, living the 24 year old life, going canoeing and kayaking and doing yoga. And um, I could go to the beach whenever I wanted. You know, I was enjoying everything. My goals at that time when I was starting to have symptoms were to stop having these symptoms. I didn't, I wanted to mm. stop running to the bathroom, I wanted to stop. Um, bleeding. I wanted, I wanted it all to stop so I could just go back to being 24 and having fun. And now I'm a wife and a stay at home mom. And that last role is the most important thing in the world to me. So right now my treatment goals are around having the energy and the presence to care for my daughter and to monitor any symptoms that might come up and get them before they get worse (laughs) and stay in remission. Mm -hmm. You know, Jacqueline, I got to interject. I love how, you know, you talked about all the things that you did at 24, what you're doing now as a mom, right? And as, as we go through life, right, our priorities change, what gives us self-fulfillment and um, enjoyment out of life changes, right? But it's that that's extremely important. So like in clinic, when we do like clinical trials and we're examining patients or we're just doing a regular history, right, with a patient, we ask the same boring questions, right? And, and to our listeners, how many times has your doctor asked you annoying questions about your bowel moves, abdominal pain? How many times do you go? How much blood do you go at night, et cetera, et cetera? But there's so much more, right, that's missed in these clinical trial scenarios or questionnaires or the basic H&P of a patient in a visit. And so I think it's really important that, you know, docs or patients relate to their doctors, right? that doc, my disease is preventing me from going canoeing or taking care of my baby or whatever it is, right? And I think that's that's a a really easy way to help people gauge uh, whether they're excelling, you know, and that that their disease is working. And I say this because I think if there's clinicians listening to this, it's a really easy question to ask. And I also have found some of my patients um, sadly have gotten used to their symptoms um, and so maybe have made compromises. And so they may not know it, right? It's just taken its toll over time. They're like, well, I used to do that, but I don't do that anymore. And you ask a little bit more like, oh, well, that's not like a great hobby. Why, why don't you collect stamps anymore? And um, just kidding. That's not a great hobby, but, I don't know what I'm <laughs> but I'm just, you know, there's so much more interesting stuff to do, but um, <laughs> my dad was a stamp collector. I never got into it, but. Oh, okay. But, I was going to uh, say, I have a little friend who's a stamp collector. So, you know, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. It's just for last people. Don't. No hate mail, <laughs> but, um, but no, you know, like, like it's, you, you may lose touch, right. With that. And so sometimes that's something that we need to tell our docs and doctors or clinicians need to ask their patients, like, what is this disease preventing you from doing? And maybe that's our goal. When you tell me you walk back in the door and you sold a stamp for $500, we high five. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's about being honest uh, first with yourself and figuring out what a good day looks for you, like what makes you feel alive and human. And then 
talk about that with your doctor. You know, before you go to the appointment, think of what those things are. And if you want to get back to that, those are your goals. You know, you have to take an active role in knowing yourself in order to take an active role in your care. Jacqueline, did you ever have one of those light bulb moments when you realized that you needed to take control of your treatment goals and advocate for yourself in a stronger way than you had been doing? Yes, absolutely. So um, the the big light bulb moment for me was when I had to search for a new primary care doctor. And um, my primary care doctor left the practice and I was told to, I was going to the next one that was at the practice, mm. a, new, a newer person. Um, it was someone who'd actually been there for a long time. So I got switched. I went in for a physical. Um, I had just been diagnosed with UC about two months ago. So I knew that I needed to build my team. I knew I needed support. I had no idea what I was dealing with. And so they had me get in a gown. She brought in the medical student, which normally I'm totally okay with. Um, but this time I wasn't asked. I don't know if at this office it's just standard that they just, I, and because I hadn't been in a while. Like I said, I wasn't really a patient of any sort before I got diagnosed. So I'm not sure about that. But the medical student stood in the doorway and the doctor came in. She introduced herself and immediately opened my gown. I sat on this, on the um, table and my gown was open and she immediately was barking out statistics to the medical student, whatever my heart was, my lungs, uh, et cetera, as she's like feeling things and going through. And I felt like a timestamp. I mm. did not feel like a human. I was sitting there and I'm like, I'm Tuesday at two o'clock. She's marking the boxes and I'm Tuesday at two o'clock. I'm not Jacqueline who just got her first big girl job. I'm not, I'm not Jacqueline. And um, finally she finished doing what she was doing. And I was, I'm pretty sure I was just in shock that it was actually happening. Um, but as she's washing her hands, she looked over her shoulder and she said, so what are you doing here? And I remember shaking my head like I was dreaming and then being like, I was recently diagnosed with ulcerative colitis and my doctor left the practice, so I'm looking for a new primary care doctor to trying to build my team so I have the support that I need. And I will never forget it. Her, she, as she looked over her shoulder at me, she said, well, that's stressful. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end. She asked me if I had any questions, and I was just like, I just looked at her blankly. I know I probably, there were a million things I could have said, but I said nothing because I was just shocked. Um, and I got in my car and I, you know, I left, got in my car and I, um, and I was like, can I switch doctors? Do I have the ability to choose my own doctor? Mm -hmm. I'm like, how do I even start doing that? And you know, this is 2013. You couldn't quickly Google anything from your phone. Maybe if you had like the internet on your phone back then, but I didn't. And back then. <laughs> and <laughs> I, so I called my, I was like, well, I'll call my insurance company. Maybe they can tell me. And that was my first step into advocating for myself. I called my insurance company. I found out that yes, I do have the ability to choose a different doctor. And they sent me a, a website that I could choose one from. And that was where I took the next step. And I found the absolute best primary care doctor. She could be listening to this. I know she does. If you do, thank you. You're the best. Yeah. Um, I like. I was going through my history and I was like, I need to send her flowers. She has done so much for me. Uh, but um, if I hadn't taken that step, I would still mm -hmm. be Tuesday at two o'clock. I wouldn't mm -hmm. be Jacqueline. You're so much more than Tuesday at two o'clock. And you know, Jacqueline, I, I just want to apologize to you on behalf of all medical education professionals, because one of the first privileges or etiquettes of, of teaching medical students, residents, fellows, house staff is, is introducing any, anybody new, right? Anybody who's really external to the patient clinician relationship to the patient and asking for their permission, explaining why they're there. And of course, above all else, talking to you, not as Tuesday at two o'clock, but as Jacqueline, you know, and I'm so sorry that happened to you. You should never have to, uh, to, to tolerate that. I'm, and I know you never will. And I'm glad uh, that's probably the biggest thing of all this, this entire talk is, right? What you have said, advocate for yourself. You're your biggest advocate. Right. Yeah. And thank you for saying that. I mean, that you didn't need to do that. And I know a majority of doctors are not that way. 
it was just, I, it was my awakening moment and I will never forget it. That's for sure. What about setting expectations? Do we just say the sky's the limit and let's just go for it? I think first off, in terms of setting expectations, it's really important for me as a doc to tell my patients not to compare themselves to someone else. Mm. Um, Because I think that it's really easy when we're given this label, this diagnosis, that we compare our story to another person or our response to a drug or a food or a supplement to another person, right? And that's not, that's normal. That's natural. That's human nature. But we know, I know, that every single one of my patients is different, uniquely different. And so we can't expect that everyone's going to behave the same or react the same or improve the same. That said, when you talk about what you said about goals, right, um, I, I try to be practical, right? It depends on where we are in the disease state, right? At what point do you come, you know, if you're very, very, very malnourished and haven't gotten the right treatment, we have smaller baby step goals. We still have positive goals going forth right, to succeed, but they may not be running a marathon yet, right? It might just be, let's introduce nutrition, let's gain weight, let's get physical therapy going, right? Um, let's get you back to, um, you know, less times in the, in, in the bathroom, right? Just small goals, but making progress. And then once we've rebuilt you, right, and, and, and you have done all the work that it takes to get there, which, which a lot of the credit goes to our patients for taking the meds and going to the visits and getting the labs and stool studies done, right? Once they've done that and they've gotten better, then we can start thinking about even bigger goals if it comes down to physical endurance. But I think not comparing one patient to another, having themselves compare themselves to, to one another, and then you know probably baby steps long-term, um, and then recognizing from the outset what the limitations might be based on side effects or surgery or whatnot. Um, but, but, but I will tell you, uh, and then I'll shut up, but, but <laughs> most of my patients, I mean... And not are stronger than I probably ever will be, and have accomplished more things physically, right? Despite having some of these these physical destructions of side effects or surgery, um, than people who have ne- who are who have who are blessed with good health, right, and didn't need to see a doctor, and that always amazes me, right? And so um, there's a limit to the physical ability. There's also almost endless capacity of what the mind and will can do. That's why IBD people are the best people, right? No, I'm just kidding. But Absolutely. No, true. no that's, true. I, I do believe that that's true because once you have seen, you know, Jacqueline, you were talking about how you were 24 and you just wanted to like live your life, but that made you see how your life was being impacted by your IBD and you probably made decisions about, right, about what you wanted to do in the future because you didn't realize how sick you could get. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a hundred percent. It was, um, and even just the the adjustment of not of realizing that I wasn't probably going to be able to do some things, um, or at least not on the agenda that I had originally planned. I had to go through that. I mean, it, it was a, it is a tough process, but you 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 grieve it and you get through it and you keep going. Like you said, uh, Neil that you take one <laughs> small step at a time. It's so uncomfortable not to call you Dr. Nandi, but I will call you Neil. <laughs> call, call, call me, call me Neil. Hey, you, I, I've responded to worse. Don't worry. Neil's good. <laughs> um, but it is exactly like you said, it's one small step. You know, I remember for me when I, I lost a ton of weight and a ton of strength and I was anemic mm. and th- this big and I had a corgi um, and you know, it was nothing to pick him up and carry him upstairs. He couldn't, he is a corgi, he couldn't go up the stairs. So um, when I got home from my stint in the hospital, I couldn't pick him up. And so my goal Mm. became getting strong enough to pick my dog up again. Um, And then from there, it was, can I do a plank? Can I get back to yoga? Can I make it this far without running to the bathroom? Can I you know, et cetera. It goes on from there for individualistic, but it's like you said, the disease is different for each person and you have to look at each person in those small steps. 
But look, I mean, you like you illustrated beautifully, right? You said you came home from the hospital and you made small incremental goals that you accomplished. And uh, now you're back to being strong, holding a baby yeah. far, far, far more heavy than a corgi. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but no, you, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's I think important. And, and I'm glad you asked the original question, because I think sometimes from what my patients have told me that they they look at what there's if they're not well and they're flaring they look at how they are now in that moment and they're comparing their old self when they were healthy right and they're like how do i get how do they're impatient understandably every right to impatient to get there and when they realize that oh i'm too weak to get to that point it feels so depressing absolutely you know it's very, it's a, it's a heavy weight it's frustrating but i think um redirecting and saying no i will get there it's just going to take steps to get back up there, incremental steps, just like you did, Jacqueline. And you will. Right. And some days it's just getting out of bed. You know, that's that's one step. Yeah. And it just, it doesn't have to be every day you're getting stronger. Some days you got to wait and then you'll get stronger again. So Jacqueline, was there a time when you had a goal that was just a little bit out of your reach? And what did you do to sort of get around that and get back on track mentally and physically? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'll... Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, <laughs> well, okay. Let me start with when I was initially flaring. Uh, when I first was diagnosed, I continued to fail at every treatment. Um, mm. yeah, I wasn't getting any treatment goals accomplished. I wasn't getting anywhere. I was going backwards. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, eventually I was able to get there and get stronger again. It was just about finding the right care team and the right treatment and the right approach. Um, and then again, more recently, again, treatment goals change. And, um, when we decided to discontinue the use of my biologic, um, I was at the time I was, I had been in deep remission for a long time. Um, it had been, I want to say like four years at that point and three or maybe three years. And I was having a hard time with the travel to my infusion center. It's about an hour and a half away, taking the time off work um, and recovering. The side effects were getting worse. So I was just, I was having a hard time with it. And my mental health wasn't so great. Um, we had also gone through a miscarriage and I was just tired of everything and I wanted a break. And my doctors knew everything. Um, and we all knew that there were cases of people coming off of their biologics in deep remission and staying there. And the goal was that I would be one of them. And so we all got on the same page. We all talked and we were monitoring and I continued to do the blood work and the stool samples and everything needed. And it was great for about six months. And then, uh, some symptoms started showing up and the plan was that I would immediately contact my doctor which I did. Um, so immediately I contacted my GI and we started the testing. I, I think I had been scheduled, I think it was two months out at that point for lab. So they just pushed it right away. And um, then I got it in and there was just a little bit, a sign of slight inflammation in my blood. So then we decided to schedule a sigmoidoscopy and we scheduled that. And then I found out I was pregnant a few days before the sigmoidoscopy and my symptoms stopped. So, um, I mean, I know this is not common listeners, not a common thing <laughs> for pregnancy. Please don't use this as an example. Right. This is just goals changing. We should all just get uh, pregnant. That's what we should right, do. If yeah, we're not, feeling well. <laughs> not common. Um, but I, I did have, I did go here. Here's one that maybe you won't want to go through this. Um, we ended up doing the procedure uh, awake, mm -hmm. no medication, nothing. So if anybody wants to talk about that, <laughs> um, it, it's actually, yeah. it's not so bad. It's not that um, bad. And yeah. I was in great care. They were amazing. But the nurse, before they took me back, she's like, what? You're not getting put under? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> so, um, that used to be we, the, the, the way, the standard way, you know, no sedation yeah. and, and a flex sig can be done gently, nicely, you know, within yeah. reason, you know. It can. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. But not something we love. I mean, 
I mean, everyone <laughs> does love like the groovy drugs, and and when we can give that, we try yeah. to be humane. I, I think that's appropriate too. Yeah, but I'm glad I think it's more mental than anything else. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were very soothing, and somebody actually came in because they thought I was asleep. Uh, somebody actually came in the room to like talk to the doctor, and the doctor was like, "You gotta go." <laughs> She's awake. She, they were like, oh, uh, so <laughs> funny things happen. Um, yeah. But anyway, after the procedure, I um, there was no signs of inflammation. So um, what whatever happened, my body is cooperating still. Um, Good for you. And Good for you. Yeah, it's been great. And we continue to monitor. And so that's kind of the treatment goals still are monitoring and like I said, I have a colonoscopy again this year. We'll make sure that everything is still healing and good to go. That is my treatment goals. We achieved them. We didn't. We achieved them. We didn't. We adjust and make changes as needed. Dr. Nandi, I think it might be fair to say that not every patient and their team is working from this model of treat to target. Do you have any advice or thoughts for patients or for providers on how to begin this discussion and then how to begin to think of treatment in terms of goals? Yeah, you know, that's, um, that's, a, that's a big question, but I'll, I'll try to answer it. I think for patients, um, something to do is listen to this podcast, right, and and share it uh, with your community of IBD friends and family, because even though treat to target is a concept um, that's been around for a long time, it's not always evenly practiced or consistently practiced, and I think it's extremely important that patients know as much as the doctors do. Okay. Um, I'm going to give a shameless plug for two websites that, that give teach on this. Okay. One is my own fitwithmd.com. And the second, there's a link from that site is a gutsy feeling.org. It's a, it's an educational grant funded project, um, that talks about treat to target and ulcerative colitis. However, it is also just as uh, equally applicable to Crohn's and, and any form of inflammatory bowel disease in terms of the concepts of treat to target at least. Um, but there's an animation there and algorithms. It's also a site for clinicians to go to as well. And it has algorithms and evidence-based articles that explain treat to target and how often to check. So I think education and spreading, spreading that knowledge is important. So, so clinicians and, and patients uh, should also know this. One of the reasons you, if you haven't heard about treat to target or this concept is because in the last few years, it was harder for your physician to get some of these tests done, the calprotectin mm -hmm. specifically, um, and even something else I didn't mention, which is therapeutic drug monitoring, monitoring drug levels for certain uh, biologic agents, okay? And that's a whole nother topic there. But now coverage is better. And so it's not perfect, um, but there's better insurance coverage, better ways to get this. So some of the financial obstacles for, for, for many patients more than before are removed. So if you have to know, um, when you every time you go to your doc, um, you should always have a good interval of understanding of when's your next scope due, okay? How often do you need a scope, right? And um, and then the next question is, okay, how do I know that I'm if I'm feeling well? How does my doctor know, and how do I know that I am in remission in that time? And the reason for this question is that it is quite possible to have no symptoms but to have active disease. And if you have no symptoms but active disease, that active disease is like an open wound or an open sore that you don't know is there and it can get infected. So the analogy I use with my patients is it's like a paper cut. You know, paper cut looks nice and clean, it hurts like a bleep. But <laughs> once, <laughs> that's my sound effect. And, and if you rub that paper cut in some muck, right, now it becomes all, you know, pus filled and angry and red and boggy, nasty, right? So if you have a paper cut and aphthous erosion or ulcer on the inside gut, that can get infected and you can flare and get C. diff, all sorts of bad things, right? So we want that to heal. And so another concept, this is how I also talk to my patients is, I want you to look as good on the inside as you feel on the outside. And, and now, hopefully, if you hear this by repetition to this podcast, if you're in remission, 
it depends on the doctor's style or the PA or nurse's style, whoever's treating you. But um, for a healthy patient, once or twice a year, blood work and maybe a stool calprotectin. Um, uh, as far as drug level monitoring, uh, it, some some patient uh, some clinicians are proactive therapeutic drug monitoring. Others may not believe in it, and that's because the data. Um, there's some controversy there. I personally am a proactive therapeutic drug monitoring proponent. So depending on the active on the drug, I will check the level once or twice a year in a healthy patient. Now, if you're flaring or you're not doing well, then at a minimum, you're probably going to get blood work, stool calprotectin, um, two to three times a year, if not four times a year or more, whatever it takes to actively see that you're getting better or getting worse. Now the question, another question is, how soon um, can you expect remission or a response, right? And that kind of depends on the medicine being used. They take anywhere from three to eight to 12 weeks to show a response, big range depending on the agent. And it depends on your biology and, and your flavor or type of, of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or indeterminate colitis and how long it takes to respond, okay? Um, so it can take time. Now, here's the other thing to know. Let's say you feel better. You can feel better before the tissue has had time to heal. And this is called tissue lag, okay? So after you start a biologic or a small molecule therapy, I typically tell my patients, all right, we're going to do these non-invasive markers, blood, stool, every three to four months. And then six to nine months after you've started, assuming you're doing well and doing much better, we'll schedule another scope, okay? Could be a flexig, could be a full colonoscopy to confirm that the tissue looks as good as the numbers and you clinically suggest, okay? So that's a little bit more detail as to how we execute um, uh, the, you know, treat to target strategies. So education, spread the knowledge, know this, and ask your doctor, ask your doctor, hey, can I, I read about this um, and some guy named Dr. Neil and Jacqueline, <laughs> All right, I'm going to drag you into this. You're my partner in crime. And Amber, okay. Started, started talking about this. And I want this, doctor. I want, I want my stool calprotectin. And I want my markers. Um, and uh, I think that I should get a scope done six to nine months after, after I've yes. started treatment. Can we clone you? Can you be the everyone's doctor? Oh, man. Or at least train Careful what you all ask the other for. doctors. <laughs> I know, right? Train a bunch of them. I, you know, I'm old enough to remember the, the I want my MTV. So <laughs> I love this. I want my fecal calprotectin. <laughs> so let's get that done. Um, so Jacqueline, how about you? Do you have any advice if new patients are thinking about, well, I've never heard of this treat to target. I mean, you had a really strong relationship with your team and you had really clear goals. How would you advise someone on how to begin that conversation and, and keep keep these goals moving? Well, I mean, I, I have a great, strong team now, um, but I didn't initially. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. I, you know, it took a while to get there. Um, and you have you have to speak up for yourself. You have to remember mm -hmm. that this is your body and it deserves to be treated well and it deserves to have a life. It's yours. It's you. Um, so you need to ask the questions. Um, my advice for talking to your doctor would be to remember that your doctor is your partner. They want you to heal. They are on this journey with you. They're, and if you don't feel like they are, tell them that. Um, if you're not feeling heard or respected, then I would say, say so, because they, you should. Um, and if, if you're still feeling that way after you've had that conversation, then go higher, talk to the supervisor of the clinic, keep going until you find someone who will listen to you. You have to be the squeaky wheel. If you want to get that treatment, you have to use your voice and you have to be the squeaky wheel if they're not listening. Now, if we can clone Dr. Nandi and everyone can be like him, uh, uh, <laughs> it would be great. And they would listen and you can have a conversation. But I think the first step is to ask how they want to communicate I know with my doctor, it's a lot through the portal. We do a lot of communication through the patient portal, and that's the easiest way to reach her. I can send her a message, and my other doctor can see it too. So uh, I can say, this is what's going on. I'm, I need to come in, blah, blah, blah. Um, some doctors prefer that you contact their nurse. Some prefer that you call and leave a message, and they'll call you back. There's at, lots of different ways of communication. 
Um, the first office that I visited when I had UC, I would hold for two hours before I could get in touch with someone. And I didn't know any better on how to reach people. Um, I, I was, when I was first diagnosed, I was brand new to being a patient in general, and there was a lot to learn. But you have to take an active role and you say, I'm, you tell them at the appointment, I waited for two hours. What's a better way to communicate with you? Is there a better way? And if there's not, maybe you find another doctor. If there is, then let's do that. Um, finally, I would say for yourself, you know, when you're making the goals, be honest. And then you have to keep those appointments and uh, take the medication, follow the plan. If there's a problem, bring it up. You can't just assume that the doctor knows or that they've seen your labs and know exactly what's going on with you. Because like you said, you could be appearing great on the outside and completely different on the inside or vice versa. Maybe you're not where you want to be. Um, so yeah, I just think you, you really have to use your voice and speak up for your body or who else is going to do it. Dr. Nadia, I was on your Instagram and I saw that you shared that you have an interest in medical history. So I was just wondering, is there anything that you can talk about, about the history of gastroenterology that you have found in your, in your studies or your research or your hobby um, that is bizarre or odd or funny? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot, actually. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll pick one that's IBD relevant. Okay, nice. Um, but I have a I have a ton I have a ton of stuff that I could share. But uh, so you know uh, they always talk about ulcerative colitis and tobacco smoke. You know that uh, if you mm -hmm. you know tobacco yes. being protective, but it's only protective for about seventy percent of UC patients. If you're a UC patient and you're listening to this, do not pick up a pack of cigarettes because the Surgeon General warns. That tobacco may lead to sudden death. No, I'm kidding. Car stroke, heart attack, <laughs> cancer. Okay, and and um, because it's harder to motivate men than women, erectile dysfunction, um, and and so that's the only way I can get my men to, to stop smoking. Um, so don't Ooh. smoke. But tobacco can be protective. In fact, when people quit tobacco, um, sometimes the classic story is a a female in their forties who quit smoking, and then six to twelve months later has bright red blood parectum is diagnosed with UC. That's like a board question. Um, but we don't recommend it because it doesn't help everybody, but 30% will have no response. Okay, so that's the background, right? So tobacco and that. Now, how do you think we started to study this, right? Somebody tried to data mine this and be like, oh my God, we got to figure out how we can make some money off this thing. So what they did was they took mice, poor little mice, nude mice. They actually shaved them down and they drank no. these nude mice. <laughs> No, they're, they're actually Wait. genetically bred not to have hair, um, but, <laughs> which is maybe even more cruel. You got me with that. You got and me. <laughs> the, the scientific model for studying um, uh, colitis is a murine model where they drink water, DSS model. It's an acid, and that's horrible because they're mm -hmm. drinking acid water. And you give medicines to the mice, and you see if their intestine heals, right? That's the basics of it, okay? So they took, like, um, the tar from tobacco cigarettes, right? And they rub it on the skin, um, and it's transdermally oh. absorbed. And guess what? The colitis gets better. Mm. Yeah. And then they thought, well, well, how else can we can we take this a step farther? I think they were saying, can we cross a line? And they said, can we <laughs> can we give these poor little mice that we've induced colitis in? Can we give them tobacco smoke enemas? And they no. did, and they get better. <laughs> now I would not want to be the lab technician, literally, literally blowing the you know, blowing little tobacco smoke into the anuses of these poor mice. But, but you, you get the, you get the visual, My right? Jaw is on the floor. And, um, but, but bottom line, they could not ever isolate, this is going back a couple of decades ago, what the magic molecules yeah. or combination mm -hmm. of molecules that was protective to induce remission in UC patients. And so it's still a medical mystery. We still, again, do not endorse tobacco smoke for UC. And again, for Crohn's patients, it makes Crohn's worse. So don't do that. So many reasons not to smoke. But, you know, I think that's some interesting medical history, some crazy medical experiments that have been done that I've been the one to look up and read. 
out of fascination, perverse fascination perhaps, but this is what the, I'm not, I, I couldn't make this up though. Tobacco smoke enemas. Interesting. Yeah, that's a, you know, stop blowing smoke kind of situation there, you know. There you go. And <laughs> when I was diagnosed, and I was diagnosed in the way, way long ago of 1989, there was more than one person that offered me a cigarette, mm. you know. Um, so it was it was one of those, um, I, I mean, there was some truth to it, but it was also kind of like uh, an old wives tale type of thing um, that people would say, oh, you have colitis? Well, maybe you should uh, take up smoking. Um, but I, I never did do that. Good, I, good choice. I was told. I was told to. Were you? And you were told to smoke mm-hmm. too. Yeah. By yep. a physician. And you were not diagnosed that long ago. Yes. Yeah, that was 2018. Wait. Yeah. Who told? Who told you to smoke? My GI. My first GI. Stop. Um, well, it was the PA at the GI office. Yeah. This, 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 <laughs> Yeah. This podcast does not capture my mouth, my jaw dropping to the floor. I mean, you did it to me with that mouth story. So I got, I got you got me back. You got like, me back, Jacqueline. Your jaw, yeah. your jaw unhinged there. Yeah, it, it was, was like, uh, oh. I, yeah. The good news is that if you do need medicines, they don't carry those types of known and higher risk, by the way, higher known multitude risk factors of stroke, heart attack, cancer, etc. So that's that's the good thing about some of the medicines that we have. <laughs> Oh my yes, gosh. Absolutely. So Jacqueline, that was kind of a funny story. I mean, not funny at the time, but we're laughing about it now. Right. Um, do you have any other funny or embarrassing stories that you can share? I do. I do. Um, I thought of one actually while we were talking about this and talking about the stool samples. So I think I'm going to go with that one. Um, I was doing my first, my very first stool sample where I had to go pick up the kit, take it home and bring it back and bring it back to the lab. And the lab that I was going with is at the main hospital in our area. And so I did the thing, take it home and bring it back to the hospital. I'm parked out front, I'm carrying it inside. And the lab is like through, it's it's in there. So I'm walking in and I bump literally into my high school crush and his wife (laughs) and they proceed to catch me up on their life for the last 10 years as i'm standing there holding literally poop in my hand in a big white bag going oh my gosh is this really happening get me to the lab how can i get out of this and so that was that was probably one of the most embarrassing moments they never asked what was in the bag but i mean it's a big white bag and i think you know Uh, so that was probably it in retrospect that's a funny story though (laughs) yeah oh absolutely i mean i think i still laughed when i got back to my car like was that real but that's like out of a ben stiller uh, movie or something i don't know so i can mm -hmm. see that yeah yeah jacqueline green dr neil nandi thank you so much for coming on about ibd and talking with me about treat to target i really appreciate your time and everything that you shared especially the mouse stories that is fantastic so thank you so much i aim to please there you go show me the line i'll cross it okay (laughs) thanks for having us this is great thank you so much both of you hey super listener thanks to dr neil nandi for sharing his knowledge and perspective on this topic and for all he does in teaching both patients and clinicians you can follow him across social media as fitwitmd which stands for Fitness Witness. Thank you also to Jacqueline Green for sharing her journey with us, including the difficult parts. It's easy for me to ask the questions, but Jacqueline had to relive some of the worst times in her life to answer them. Thank you for the gift of your story, Jacqueline. It will help so many in the IBD community. You can follow Jacqueline on Instagram as Jacqueline Hopes. Links to a written transcript, everyone's social media handles, and more information on the topics we discussed can be found on my episode 109 page on aboutibd.com. You can follow me across all social media as About IBD. Thanks for listening. And remember, until next time, I want you to know more about IBD. This American Gastroenterological Association Colitis Conversations program was supported by Pfizer, Inc., about IBD is a production of Malintel Enterprises. It is written, produced, and directed by me, Amber Tresca. Mix and sound design is by Max Cooney. 
Theme music is from Cooney Studio.